Welcome to Breaking Bible with the Tully Adventurers. Explore! It's a good day for some good news. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. That's Jesus' good news to us in John 16, 33. As we face this new day and all it has for us, we find courage and hope in the only trustworthy words available. Tell the adventurers, explore. The Bible. Good morning, good morning. Hope you're having a great day wherever you're at. Maybe it's a good night for you. So we'll just say, good day. And then we are going to move into the year of 2022. So we're going to talk about grace and what grace is and what it means. We're going to look at some Bible verses about grace. And of course, this is one of my favorite things to do. Take some things out of context and use them however you want and then <laughs> pretend that you've understood what they really mean. Um, obviously, I'm being sarcastic. It's a bit of a joke. One of the beauties of the Bible is it is literature. And so it's supposed to be taken as literature, not literally and not just symbolically and not just... However you want to read it, it's actually literature. So some of it is letters that have been written from a person to people that uh, that person cares about. Some of it is songs. Some of it is legend or epic stories. And if we don't read it as such, then we're going to miss out on what the writer was trying to express and help us to understand about life and God. And so... As we go through these, I'll let you, Jennifer, read the verse, and then I'll give some background information about where the verse is coming from, if I know it, and then we'll talk about what that verse means for our lives and for how we're going to interact with the world and each other in this year of 2022. So, let us begin with the very first one there, <clears throat> and make sure you read the address as well when you get to the bottom. Oh, that's what that's called? It's a joking Christianese term that we use. What's the address of the verse? So, Learn something new sense. every day. All right. <laughs> Street name and number. Okay. All right. Now God has us where he wants us. With all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Jesus Christ. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably just go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and saving. He creates us, he creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him to join him in, and then it stops. <laughs> no period, just stops. Nice. And what's the... The address <laughs> is Ephesians 2.8. And so Ephesians is a letter that was written by Paul, and the purpose of the letter was to help a church in a very specific town um, with their faith and with the way they need to live out their faith as they go about their daily lives and their business of whatever they're doing. Um, so often it's easy for us to forget that when you write a letter to a specific group of people or a specific person, it's going to be different than if you wrote it to someone else. So the analogy I like to use is when I was in Iraq as a soldier, I am a disabled veteran. Um, when I wrote a letter home to my grandpa or an email home to my grandpa, the things I would tell him are different than if I wrote a letter home to my girlfriend. Um, I'm not going to tell my grandpa, ooh, I love you, kissy face, or whatever stuff may have gone into the letter to my girlfriend because my grandpa was a veteran of war. He understood what it was to be a soldier during wartime. So there were things that I could share with him that I wouldn't share with other people because he had a similar understanding of what I was going through as a soldier. Whereas, once again, to, as in a letter to a, my girlfriend, it would be more romantic. It would be about how much I miss her and I love her and um, can't wait to see her, that kind of stuff. Um, so very different in writing to each of these individual people. In the same way, we're actually going to 
go through a couple more of these different letters to different groups of people. And so, um, if I remember right, we went through Ephesians last year, and um, the people in Ephesus were kind of what were what kind of people were they? I don't remember specifically. I can't think of it right now. So maybe you can go back to some of our podcasts through Ephesians and listen to those and consider how they're different than the people in some of these other places. But once again, that's about context and remembering who is being written to. Yes. I do remember that some of the people that Paul wrote to were um, seemed to be more business-like, mm-hmm. where other people seemed to be more creative. Ephesians was a hierarchy. Um, Mm. Ephesians has a lot of the hierarchy stuff. So it talks about, um, it has one of the most controversial um, verses, which is, wives submit to your husbands. But it also talks about, uh, if you are a servant or a slave, submit to your master. If you're a master, treat your servants and slaves as human beings, not just as useful tools. Um, children respect your parents parents don't browbeat and bully your kids just because you're bigger and stronger than them so Ephesians is very much about uh, this hierarchical nature of the world because hierarchies exist there are people who are physically more powerful or emotionally more powerful or more capable at doing certain things One of the reasons people are fascinated with the Joe Rogan show is because he talks to people from different walks of life who are capable in different things. So when he talks to a medical doctor, he's going to get different information than if he talks to a comedian and different information from both of those people than when he talks to an MMA fighter because he's speaking to these people not just about general life but also for them specifically what are they capable of and really good at okay what can you tell me about that thing that's going to give me information inside information that i'm not going to get as someone who's not an mma fighter or a comedian or a medical doctor and by listening to these people and understanding that they know information that we don't we can appreciate their authority it doesn't mean they're always right but it does mean they know information that we generally don't know because we haven't been following it. So these hierarchies exist, and as Paul writes to the people in Ephesus, what I love about this particular verse is he's really bringing home the idea that no matter what level of authority you have, that doesn't mean you're the ultimate authority. You're not God. You're not Jesus. And so for me, this verse is about how God is the one who's doing all the work. God is the one who's saving us. Jesus, he sent Jesus to save us. Saving is all his idea and all his work. So I know for me personally, I get caught up in the idea that I can save my friends from their pain or save people I love from pain that they're going through or from suffering that they're going through. And it's not true. Luckily, God is the one who has us right where he wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us. And one of the hardest things to understand is there are people who don't want the kindness and grace of God because we want to be right. And in order to accept grace, we have to admit that we're wrong, that what we're doing is not the very best thing to be done. And we're not interacting with the world the way God intended or calls us and requires us to. What stood out for you as you read this verse? Was there something in particular that was important? Um, Yes, just a second. I just need to find it. Sure, absolutely. And so one of the other interesting aspects of this, or I'll I'll use this, it's something that happened recently. If you check out our YouTube channel, you can watch some of these things. Uh, We were driving um, from Orlando towards the Keys. We're in Key West right now in Florida. And um, Jen and I started having a conversation about um, what the conversation came to was Jen was teaching her sons how to be courteous. So as men, how do they be courteous towards women who they're taking the prom or going to a dance or on a date with? And the 
the things that men need to do to be courteous is to have control over their strengths. Well, men have strength in spatial awareness and physical strength. Their sh broader shoulders make them bigger than most females. And so to for a man to be courteous is to use that strength in gentleness, under control, to pull out a chair for their date, or open a door for her, or do the help her up out of the car. Um, this is showing kindness and gentleness, uh, power under control, to help someone else. And then my question to Jen was, okay, so what is the courtesy that women need to give back to men so that there's a fair exchange here? If a man's going to be courteous to a woman by controlling the strength of his physical nature and his spatial awareness, what is it that a woman needs to do? And Jennifer was dumbfounded. Uh, it's not something that most people in our culture think about. We don't consider what is a woman then, to be fair, going to give back to the man to be courteous to him. And what we came to was women have more capability with words and more emotional strength. And so not interrupting a man is really important to allow him to figure out what he wants to say or try to find the words because we as men don't have as many words available to us so it's very difficult for us to find the words we want to use particularly when we're younger and growing up and if we pursue words then we can get better at them but for most even if we pursue them women will still have more words available to them be more capable with words and so the courtesy that women show is to not expose men's weakness um, to have a vault where if a man shares a story where he is exposing his weakness that she protects that and doesn't make it bigger or broader for the world to see and so that was a conversation we had one day the next day we were excited and driving down to the keys and um, I, I got really frustrated because I decided that I was going to expose a little bit of my weakness. And I pointed out that in our RV, I have made some mistakes while driving the RV, and it's led to the RV getting some dings and dents in it. Um, and I was really heartbroken because Jen, we were both excited and Jen, you decided to go, yeah, it's worse than you're telling them, it's this. <laughs> on the one hand, that's, that can be very funny. But on the other hand, to me, that's like I'm putting on a bikini to show off some of my body and you've just ripped it off and exposed me entirely to the public. And I want so badly to save my wife from doing that kind of thing. And really what it means is I want to save myself from the pain of being exposed that way. But the problem is I'm not the one who gets to save myself from that pain or her from that pain. And if I decide that instead of having grace, learning how to be graceful from God so that I can forgive her and forgive myself for being so embarrassed about this thing that's not that big a deal, forgive myself for taking it so personally and being so hurt by it, then our relationship isn't going to work. And it's so easy for me to go down the path of, I want to save her when really I'm just trying not to feel as much pain myself. And so God is the one who's created us and given us the opportunity to be saved by Jesus. Since God created us, he gets to judge what's right and wrong, not me. And Jesus is the one who saves. So I don't get to save my wife from making some of these mistakes that she's naturally going to make or save myself from the mistakes that I'm naturally going to make. Like I said, I've, I've caused small accidents to my trailer, which has left some, some damage to it. And I don't get to save myself from that either. We live in an imperfect fallen world. And... I need to remember that I have to forgive myself and I have to forgive my wife and to have relationship is to let go of the idea that I'm right and that she should never hurt me that way. That's 
more of what I get from this verse, and it's it's painful for me, but it's really good. What about you, my love? What did you get from this verse? <clears throat> Saving is all his idea and his work, and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. Um, I think it's easy to get into a place where you've made some choices one day that weren't maybe in the best category. They were just in the feeling category. Mm -hmm. I feel like doing this wasn't necessarily what was best for me. Um, and then beating ourselves up over it. Right. Being angry with the world because we're angry at ourselves and trying to suck everybody else into our anger and spreading that around instead of accepting that that was yesterday, that's what happened, and going to God because he's the only one that's going to save us. He's the only one that's going to save us from ourselves. And the hard part is trusting him enough to let him do it. Yeah. Because I think I should be able to fix that. Mm. I should have enough willpower to do that. Mm. And to know that our willpower has limitations. That just because we will something, that doesn't mean it's going to come into existence. is really difficult and painful. That's really good stuff. Really good stuff. Very good. Excellent. So yes, when we're caught in authority and hierarchies and all of these things, part of life is understanding that these hierarchies exist and that we're going to make mistakes and that God is the one who is actually at the top of all of these hierarchies. And if we want to have access to really being and access to God's grace and kindness, we have to accept it. And I think that's one of the saddest parts of reading this verse is recognizing the flip side of this is that even though God has set us all up to spend eternity giving us his grace and kindness and showering his grace and kindness on us, the requirement for receiving grace and kindness is letting go of being right. And there are plenty of people who are going to decide that they're right and they're going to stay right and as long as they get to be right that's all that matters and holding on to being right we've talked about this a lot before it's closing your hands around I'm right and what I did was right and that means you don't you can't accept grace you can't accept mercy you can't accept kindness you can't accept anything that God wants to give you until you let go of being right and like I said I've been struggling with I want to blame my wife for this pain that I felt when the reality is I'm not right. I'm also wrong for holding on to this anger, for not forgiving my wife, for pretending that what I did was right or the right way to handle the situation. And by God's grace, you know, when Jen used her emotional capability and word capability and it was overwhelmed me by God's grace I did not do fair play which would be to use my spatial awareness and physical strength to come back and hurt her um, which is something that happens a lot in this world and it's heartbreaking um, but I thank God that his grace allows us to not only accept that what we've done is hurtful to other people or to ourselves, but also that he forgives us. And so we can forgive ourselves and we for can forgive each other. And then we can get back to right relationship and enjoying that grace and kindness that God gives. And I love you very much, Jen. And I'm grateful that you're my wife. And I know that sometimes I've done things that are painful to you. And sometimes you've done things that are painful to me. This isn't about blame. It's about receiving grace because we're not, we're not right. And when we admit that what we've done is wrong, we can receive grace. So I want to say to you, I'm sorry. What I did was wrong. Will you forgive me? I held on to anger about something you did to me instead of having a conversation with you 
and allowing our relationship to come back to where it's supposed to be instead of being broken and messed up because of this thing I was holding against you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, let's move on to the next verse. Because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. Three times I did that and then he told me, my grace is enough, it's all you need. I'll stop there because the next one is not a sentence. Is the address there? Second uh, Corinthians twelve nine. Mm. Is that how you read the address? Yeah. Okay. You can go Second Corinthians chapter twelve verse nine, but you don't need to. It's, okay. That what you did was great. Um, Jen was raised in the Catholic Church, where um, reading the Bible is looked upon differently than the Protestant Church looks at at it. The Protestant church thinks that you should be reading the Bible on your own and doing what you can to not only understand it, but let God's grace teach you how to understand it. Um, whereas in the Catholic church, how was it for you? What was your experience? Yeah, I can only speak to my experience in the Catholic church because it is a worldwide organization and it is, I mean, there's millions of people sure. that are Catholic. So, um, in my experience though, with the Bible, it was, uh, pieces and parts of it that were taken and put into the missalette, which is like kind of your your workbook for the day, sure. you know, to follow along with, with church. And so uh, there were letters in there. And I remember, you know, I remember the person uh, at the lectern saying, you know, the letter to Paul to the Corinthians or whatever. So I definitely remember that. Um, but it was always just a piece. It was never, you know, open your Bible. And the interesting thing is, is that I do remember though, that at every church, there was both missalettes, which is what we follow, and the Bible was right there. Mm -hmm. But it was never a, hey, open your Bible to this verse or, or whatever. Um, and uh, during the homily, that's when the priest, you know, talks about what the readings were for the day. Mm -hmm. um, he would, you know, describe what that, was about um, and I will say as I got older it became more <clears throat> it seems like it became more practical mm -hmm. it wasn't just ideas okay um, but a very different experience than going to uh, a Protestant church mm -hmm. which is Look this up in your Bible. Like, that is the only book available there. Yeah. So. Gotcha. Um, so, Corinthians, there's two letters that we know of that Paul sent to the Corinthians. This is the second uh, letter. And um, just looking at what he's talking about here, there's probably some pride going on in Corinth. Uh, the church in Corinth is probably trying to... And this is a very normal thing, especially if you're feeling... Uh, rejected or hurt or not like you're part of society um, is to try to then go well we're better than society because we do this or we're in this church or we're part of this denomination I know that growing up for me I was in a non-denominational church but it was Pentecostal and so um, yeah I don't understand what you just said so the idea was we did not <laughs> We were an individual church, so we weren't part of a group of Pentecostal churches, <clears throat> but we were still part, uh, we still did Pentecostal things. So if you've ever watched the videos on YouTube, now they've got like metal music behind these people walking up and pushing people over, it looks like, putting their hand on their forehead and then the person falls over, or things like that are going on. That's part of the Pentecostal um, way of being in church. And um, 
all churches tend to ha- tend to say, well, this is what makes us better or different. We think baptism is more important than communion. We think that communion is more important than speaking in tongues. We think that speaking in tongues. And so the Pentecostals think that speaking in tongues makes them uh, closer to God, if you want to call it that. And it got to the point where there was even um, people who said, you're not saved unless you, you, you can speak in tongues, which is not biblical. But it's one of the things that Paul's talking about here as he points out, you're not better than other churches or society or other people just because you go to church or speak in tongues or you've been baptized or, uh, you know, you were sprinkle baptized when you were a baby or you were full immersion baptized when you were an adult. None of these things, or you take communion every week or whatever it is, none of these things that the church does that are part of how we show our faith in God make us better than other people, other churches, anything like that. That isn't isn't realistic. And so it's so great this verse specifically because Paul's pointing out I have this weakness, this handicap, and we don't know what it is. We're, we're not told in the Bible, and I don't think any of, any of the historical books talk about it. Um, so we don't know if Paul had a clubbed foot or if he had, you know, he just had lust issues or he had, um, you know, was it a spiritual issue? Was it a physical issue? We don't know. What we do know is Paul changed his outlook about this thing that was going on in his life that was a handicap to see it as a blessing from God because it causes him instead of saying I'm better than others because God's called me to you know be this great missionary who writes these letters that take up you know what is it almost a third of the Bible is letters from Paul to the churches Um, he could easily say I'm so much better than everybody else and yet he has this handicap and the way he looks at it is this is a blessing from God it's a gift from God Um, for me personally I have PTSD I'm a disabled veteran and it's so easy to get down in this um, my life's not valuable I'm not valuable because I don't fit into society because I'm a veteran and as a disabled as someone who's disabled that makes me even less valuable to read this verse and deal with the reality that life is not about my strength. Life is not about my capability. Life is not about my ability or willingness to fix things. Life is not about me, 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 or what I'm going to do. Life is about God and what God has created us to be and how God is going to use even the things that we think of as a handicap or a disability to show his glory. It's all about his grace. And if we're willing to get into, uh, in the message version of the Bible, uh, one of the sentences is the unforced rhythms of grace. Not I'm going to fix it. God's doing something here that's bigger than me. Not I'm strong enough to handle this situation. No, God's doing something in this situation, and if I'll stop trying to make it what I want it to be, God is going to do something amazing with it. Get into that unforced rhythm of grace where I'm seeing an eternal perspective and something bigger than just what I want, that God is then going to do amazing things and make everything work together for good. I like to say that God uses the minimum amount of pain to help people change or to get people to change and if we're stubborn we have to go through more and more pain but the the quicker we are to release and let go of I'm right or what I'm doing is right um, then God is able to change our hearts and change the situation and it doesn't have to be as painful for us Um, and so it's okay that I have this disability it's okay that I'm handicapped God is going to use this for his glory if I'm willing to trust his grace instead of my ability. So that's basically what I get from this verse, and it, I don't like it. I don't want it to be true. I'd rather, you know, use my own strength, use my own confidence, use my own capability, use my own belief in God has given me physical strength and capability. Um, but God is also willing to humble me so that I have to trust him. 
What do you get from this verse, my love? Yeah. I have a question. Sure. For you. Absolutely. So, what does having grace for your you and your disability and all that? What does that look like? <laughs> Great question. That I still don't like because once again I don't like any part of this uh, reality. Um, it means that sometimes I need to just take a nap. It means that sometimes I need to not be around people. It means that when I embarrass myself in front of people because of my disability, um, I can just laugh it off. It's okay that I don't fit into normal society. Sometimes it's it means that when those types of things happen. So, you know, one thing that I struggle with is still when I see trash on the side of the road, sometimes my brain goes, that's a bomb, it's gonna blow up, you need to stay away from it. Um, when really it's just a piece of trash. And if I tell a friend, um, they might just look at me like I'm crazy, which to a civilian, that idea is crazy. Um, but it's an opportunity, God's using that as an opportunity for them to be challenged in the way they think about the world and be challenged in the way that they show kindness and gentleness to me and to other people who are um, handicapped. And so when I'm willing to step back from this is how it affects me personally into this is how God might use this situation. And it's not me saying God has to use it that way. It's me saying, I don't know what God is doing. I don't know how God's going to use this to affect other people's lives, um, but it's okay for me to have the struggles that I have. Um, does that answer your question? Is that kind mm -hmm. of so? And of course, one of the problems is I oscillate between, you know, seeing this bigger perspective of what God is doing back into I'm just feeling scared and hurt and don't want anyone, you know, I'm in my fighting stance because I don't want anyone to see just how weak I am. Um, and I oscillate between the two. And so to be aware of that is also an important aspect of life. What does this verse mean for you, my love? I need a minute. I have to look at it again. That's how it works. So as she's looking at that, um, having grace for ourselves, accepting God's grace is about Letting go of this idea that we have to be strong. Letting go of this idea that we have to be super capable. It is wonderful to build our capabilities. It is wonderful to be capable of doing things, um, to, of earning a paycheck because of what we're capable of doing. But it's also wonderful to admit that we have to learn. And our whole lives are going to be about learning because... We don't know, and it's okay. We don't have to be embarrassed that we still have things to learn or that there's things we're ignorant of. I would not put a scalpel in my hand and allow me to do surgery on anybody because I have not trained to be a surgeon. In the same way, there's plenty of things that I don't know enough about and would need grace for if I'm going to learn how to do them. From driving a forklift to pulling my trailer without having accidents. <laughs> Um, to all kinds of things. And even when I've learned how to do it, and we're full-time RVers, we've been pulling our trailer for three years now, and still accidents can happen, and it's not the end of the world. And I don't have to get so angry and think that people are trying to hurt me or against me just because accidents happen. So what do you get from this verse, my love? I don't even know if it fits perfectly, but it's what came into my head, so sure. it's what I'm being moved on. All right. Um... It says, at first I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things uh, growing up that I thought about or that was I didn't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to embarrass myself. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, I remember I would be in a group of people, um, particularly like my colleagues at Redken, because I came from a small town. And to me, they were like big city people, which is not true. But in the beginning, that's kind of how my head worked about it. And I remember I'd be walking through them, maybe I can think of one time I was carrying some food, we were at lunch. And I remember praying, please God, do not let me spill this on myself. Do not let me drop this. And I kid you not, as soon as it, the thought came to my head, my drink spilled and went all down the front of me, right in front of everybody. And oh my gosh, I beat myself up over it. I was so embarrassed and I just wanted to crawl in a hole. 
and I don't think anybody else thought anything of it. You know, maybe a couple people giggled. Um, some other people were like, oh my God, are you okay? Like, do you need anything? Here, let me get you a paper towel or whatever. But I was so embarrassed and for a long time I was just like, that thought would pop into my head and I'd just cringe over that thought. And it wasn't until much later um, that I realized that I actually, when I was teaching, I actually connected better with people when I was just okay with being embarrassed. You know, if I lost my place speaking, I could just say, my mind's blank, like, where were we? <laughs> um, and that people were much more receptive to that. Um, for a long time in life, I felt like I was not um, accepted socially. I felt like an outcast. I could be in a group of people and feel alone. And um, it, it's funny, uh, but in my head, I was going to be, that is, I was going to be right. I am not going to embarrass myself. I am not going to be, I'm not going to feel embarrassed. Mm. Well, that's ridiculous. Uh, but once I let go of that, um, I felt much more comfortable in the presence of other people, much more comfortable. I think they felt more comfortable because I would get cold, told all the time that I was very cocky and I was very, um, yeah, that word cocky came up a lot. And I, I would always be just perplexed by that because certainly not how I felt in my inside. I felt weak and vulnerable and, you know, so, um, grace is enough. God's grace is enough. So how do relationships actually happen? How do you get to feel like you're part of the group or in a relationship with someone? What? In other words, to make it very personal for me, why do you keep asking me these questions to tell my stories about things that I'm embarrassed about? Um, so that I can get to know you. Mm -hmm. So how do you get to be part of a group or in relationship with people? I have to be willing to share my stories. Your stories? Like your proud stories where you're the hero? No, my vulnerable stories. You have to be willing to be embarrassed mm -hmm. and tell the stories of when you... Because that's how we connect as humans. Mm -hmm. We've all made mistakes. Go ahead. Another example popped into my head. Um, I was... So I'm a hairdresser, but I teach. So sometimes that's on a stage. And my stage partner, um, when I got done off stage that particular day, he was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. And he's like, you know, I really wasn't sure who was going to be up there. Was it going to be like fun Jennifer who engages or was it going to be quiet Jennifer who sits in the corner? Mm. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? And it was a matter of letting go. It wasn't a matter of giving more. Yeah. And for a long time, I thought it was giving more. Mm. So. Good stuff. Can we do one more verse? I think so. Okay, we'll try doing one more verse. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Mm. What's the address for this verse? Hebrews 4.16. Hold on, do I keep looking at it so you know what it means to you? Um, Hebrews, I think is still another letter from Paul, but this one might have been from Peter, because Peter was the one who was actually the missionary to the Jewish people, who already knew all about God and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, whereas Paul was the missionary to the Gentiles. The point is, Hebrews is written to a bunch of very religious people who know all about God, quote-unquote, 
and they know how to have a relationship with God, and their whole ancestry is about God promised us this, and we're descendants of Abraham, we're descendants of Moses, we are the people that God gave these promises to, we're special because God has, has made us special. Um, a lot of religious pride, a lot of self-righteousness, and of course the actual stories in the Bible are all about how they rebelled against God over and over and over and God's kindness and gentleness brought them back and gave them back their land and then after a little while they stopped worshiping God and started worshiping whatever else at which time the consequences for doing that God sent prophets and said hey if you keep doing this you're going to get in trouble and you're gonna to have to deal with the consequences and what's the what's the rest of the story they just kept doing it then Babylonians came in, the whoever came in conquered them, took them away from their land, and, you know, even in the time where Jesus is with them, the Romans have conquered them. They're not their own people that get to be in right relationship with God and rule over themselves because at, we're all, they are an example of what being human is, which is we don't actually want to do what God has called us to do. We want to do what we want to do. Um, and the consequences are getting wrecked. <laughs> and so this is a letter to these people who have a history and an ancestry of being in relationship with God, and yet they still need to be reminded and at this point told, who is Jesus and how does he change our relationship with God? Um, and I love it that Jesus is called the high priest here. The high priest was the one who was the connection point with God for the people. The people weren't able to just walk up to God and be like, Hey God, I need forgiveness, or I'm feeling this way, or hey, why don't you help me out with this stuff? Oh, no, no, no. The people came to the priest, and the priest were the intermediary between the middleman between them and God. And so Jesus has now taken over that position, and God knows everything that we feel, and now we can boldly come to the throne of grace, as the, Bible, the verse tells us in the Bible, and we can come up to God and say, hey, God, you're our Father, we need you, we love you, may your kingdom come and your will be done, and I'm going to talk to you like someone who I actually have a relationship with and know, not like this, you know sort of out of touch and distant deity. Um, so that's what Hebrews is about. And Jennifer, what does this verse say? To, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you as you read this verse? What are you what are you feeling and hearing? The last sentence really stands out to me. Take the mercy, accept the help. <laughs> uh-huh. Keep going. What is, why is that for your life and how you've lived your life? Why does that sentence stand out so much? It's always been easy for me to help other people. Mm -hmm. Easy. I, I relish that time. Sure. But accepting help from other people, so difficult for me. Why is that? Much easier now. But um, there's so many reasons that that is. Okay. Um, not wanting to be embarrassed mm -hmm. is, is one of the big ones. Um, not wanting to show weakness. Feeling like I always had to be strong. Um, You're doing really well. What else? safe and it's okay. What else? Feeling like sense? no one understood what I was going through. And so not wanting to share all that because I had this feeling like if I let any part of it out, I'm going to fall apart and I'm not going to come back. Oh, okay. And um, 
That's not true. It is and it isn't. Who you will come back as when you've fallen apart is different than the person that you were. And that's a good thing. That's, that's what growing is. That's what becoming who you're supposed to be is. Letting go of the things that are holding you back from being who God created you to be. And the tighter we hold on to those things, the more pain we have to go through. Mm -hmm. So what else? Keep going. Um, or how did it, what, what changed? What, what caused it to change? What allowed you to decide that you were going to be willing to accept help? Part of it was pain, you know, not, not being able to ask for help when I needed it and just handling it on myself. I mean, it did damage to my body. Um, it damaged relationships. Um, so you see a direct correlation between trying not to be embarrassed, not uh, allowing anyone else to help you, always being the person who was going to help others but never being helped, and physical damage that happened to your body, relational damage. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to tell us specifics? It's okay if you're not. Um, I can't think of any right off the top of my head. I mean, I can think of physical pain. Like, I ended up having to have surgery on my back because you know, I moved myself and my sons a couple times myself um, so you you moved from one house to another house and you tried to physically move all of your stuff no matter how heavy it was mm -hmm. you were gonna make you were gonna force it to happen mm -hmm. and then being hurt because people that were close to me did not offer to help and I took that as they weren't going to help me not an opportunity for you to ask them for help yes and did you ask them for help? You know, I honestly don't remember. I may have or not. But just because somebody doesn't help you in that moment doesn't mean they don't want to help you ever. Mm, that's a huge thing to remember. Uh-huh. Yeah, sometimes people don't have time or availability for that one moment, but mm -hmm. that doesn't... They, they would if they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Um... So receiving help, being willing to be helped. Mm -hmm. You said that you wanted to be strong and wanted to... I know that we've talked before about you thought of your grand, grandmas, your, the women in your family, as tough broads. And so you wanted to be this tough broad. And the problem with being tough all the time is it means no one else gets to be tough for you. Mm -hmm. What about relationships? Uh, you mentioned that some relationships got damaged or broken. Well... I think it kept relationships from happening too, mm. because, um, you know, I think back and I think, you know, when I was able to help other people, it, you know, it starts to build that bridge. Mm -hmm. But if I don't allow them to help me at all, then the other side of the bridge doesn't get built. Yeah. And it, it took a long time to figure that out. Um, a long time. It's heartbreaking to feel alone especially when we think we're doing the things we need to do, helping others, mm -hmm. and we don't recognize that we're not doing the actual main thing we need. One of the best ways and easiest ways to build relationship is to ask for help, mm -hmm. allow someone else to help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else about this in particular that you want to say or, or let people know about or ways that your heart has changed. Are you accepting grace and help now? Yes, definitely. Um, I, it still doesn't come perfectly sure. at all. Sure. I have to really think about asking for help. I know, um, for us, like with you and I, you don't, you don't recognize emotion. So it's like, I might have it, I think, all over my face, like, I'm struggling here, and you're right there. Why do you not recognize that I need help? But you don't recognize that. And that's the thing. People don't recognize that. It is not a given that 
it's just not. And um, so having to ask you for help is very humbling mm. and difficult. And to recognize that we have to use words. We have to use our words and say out loud, will you help me? And be ready to accept their answer, whether it's I can't right now, or I can't at all, um, I can't with this particular thing. You know, we talked about with the Ephesians verse, there's levels of authority. It would be silly to ask someone who's not a surgeon to do a surgery on you. But when you need help, when you need a surgery, you better go find a surgeon. If you want to learn how to fight, you probably don't want to go to the surgeon. You want to go to someone who's trained in MMA and knows what they're doing. If you want to learn how to speak in front of people, you could go to a comedian or someone who actually does public speaking and learn from them. But it would be silly to go to someone who's shy and not willing or able to speak in public and ask them, hey, how do you speak in public? So we have to also admit that it is the person who has the capability and the strength to do a thing, that's the person who you need to ask for help from. Um, so for me personally, what's going on in this verse, it seems like it's the wrap up now that we know what we have. Okay. Paul or the writer of the letter has explained everything that they need to know. Now that we know what are we going to do with it? And so this is the practical advice. And what's really painful is this is not the practical advice that we like as humans. I'm totally with you. Um, take the mercy, accept the help is not the advice that I want to hear. I want to hear, this is how you can do it. Here's the YouTube video on how to do it. Get it done. Okay, you can go DIY, do it yourself. You can do it. Self-help is the only help. No, 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 those are lies. <clears throat> there are things we can do ourselves, but there's also things that we need help with. Once again, don't ask me to do your surgery. I'm going to keep pounding that one. <laughs> um, there are people who can help us because they've been trained to do it. And we better figure out how to accept the help from them. Uh, be willing to go to the doctor when we need to go to the doctor. Um, and I love this part. Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God. So often, like I said, we feel disconnected from people. We feel disconnected from God. We feel like we're all alone. And we don't recognize that if we don't want to feel alone, we need to cry out or ask for help. We need to ask for help from the people who can help us. If we want to feel connected to God, Jesus is the high priest who has access to God. We've got to go to him. We've got to let him help us be connected to God. And that's the most basic aspect of living life. Because God is the one who gives us all of our energy and power and capability and wisdom to know how to use all those things. And he's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all. We don't have a high priest. We don't have a God who doesn't know what it feels like to be human. Our God has felt all the things that human beings are going to feel and interacted correctly. Didn't let his emotions determine what he was going to do. Instead, submitted himself to God and did what was right even when he felt a different way there are so many stories about Jesus where he's betrayed by his best friend or he calls his best friend Satan get behind me Satan you're not thinking of what God wants you're thinking of what you want um, all these different stories where you know people who one day are are saying hail to the king you're you're great uh, the next day are, are screaming crucify him. Um, people who wanted to, you know, treat Jesus badly. And Jesus felt all of it, all the different things, all the different ways. Um, you know, lustful desires that he didn't give in to. Um, always submitting himself to what God wanted, not what he personally wanted or felt like doing. And so we have a God who knows what it is to feel like doing the wrong thing and do the right thing anyway. And that's who we can learn from. Um, so I'm grateful that 
we can take the mercy. We can get the help. We can receive the help that we need. And it's not, once again, I don't like it. We don't have to like these verses. We don't have to feel good about being told that the thing we need to do is the one thing that we don't want to do. But regardless of how we feel about it, take the mercy, accept the help. Be willing to admit that our feelings are not showing us the right way to go. Um, so much love, Tully Adventures. We're so grateful to have you with us. We hope that you're enjoying these conversations and will continue to be with us. Let people know about these if you're, if you're getting something from them. Um, we're just grateful to have you here. So when you get a chance, follow and subscribe on Twitch to chat with us. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you for joining us on this adventure. Much love, Tully Adventures. Explore.